Um, yeah, I, this this talks um, is the well. It's the first time I've I've given this talk. I I, I authored it on the way here. Um, it's um, possibly a little radical for most of the people like here, but um, I, I wouldn't normally give this talk at, an uh, at a conference. I give it like in the back room of a pub with something with a beer in hand. Um, but I figured, you know, Amir's here who, who got me into sort of crypto in the very first place, you know, four years ago. Um, and, you know, it would be a miss if I didn't say something a little bit, you know, controversial. So, um, so here it goes. Um, now, the point of the talk is to give you a bit of an understanding about um, Web3, um, what it is, why we're doing it, uh, where I think it will go, ramifications, repercussions, yada, yada. And I split it up into four bits. And the first bit is just trying to explain um, what, you know, kind of what's the, what's the state of society such that we, we even care. So I want to just kind of explore a little bit about where we are today as um, you know, as a a modern society. Um, right, I don't make this work. No, nope, doesn't work. Issue with this. Bottom, I think. Oh, bottom is 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 forward. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I want to cover some headlines over the past few years. Um, here's one. Um, does everyone know what this news story refers to? Yeah. Snowden. Yeah. Okay. Not nod your head. Anyone doesn't know what it refers to? No, okay. Um, so this is part of the Snowden revelations, basically um, uh, probably the biggest um, security service in the world, certainly the best funded security service in the world, um, had, uh, had programs that of very questionable legality tapped its citizens' data. Um, another one, again, Snowden revelations. Um, quarter of a billion spent a year uh, on basically collaborating with um, private firms to uh, ensure that the data processed by those private firms um, was uh, compromised and, uh, and got into the hands of people who shouldn't necessarily have had it, but certainly without the user's consent. Another one, more recent. Um, this is um, part of a wider um, a movement of uh, governments of late to try and um, reduce and, and, and remove security from uh, the technology that we use day to day in order to do business um, and communicate with each other. Um, in this case, it's academics criticizing the government over its efforts um, to, um, uh, to weaken uh, security in civilian space. Um, Another one, um, this is referring to uh, basically the, uh, the head of the CIA lying, like barefaced lying to, uh, to their political bosses over uh, precisely what the CIA was up to um, uh, in, um, in data collection on politicians. A bit more recent. Um, now this is, um, I, would, I would argue, one of the repercussions of um, this. Um, general uh, sustained attack against uh, IT security that uh, the leaders of the free world are, uh, are attempting to do. Um, this is where um, you know the now French president's uh, email shortly before the elections uh, was hacked by a foreign government unknown. <laughs> mm. um, possibly yes, one of the repercussions of lack of civilian um, internet security. And another one. Um, now this, if you, there's a website, right, and you can, you can like read all about all of the data breaches in history. This is one of thousands. Um, one of the bigger ones, one of the more recent ones, one of the more dangerous ones, but still one of very, very many. Um, in this case, it was um, all of the important information uh, of uh, an awful lot of uh, citizens um, who would um, sort of given their data and trusted their data to this uh, private firm in order to uh, be given a credit score or whatever, in order to facilitate some particular interaction that they wanted to make. Okay. Now I'm going to argue, I'm going to put it to you that the tools that we have um, available to us, that we have created, 
um, are, are broken. And these tools, we need them. We need them to interact more and more in the present day. Perhaps 50 years ago, they would have been irrelevant. But today, it's very difficult to do anything without using the internet, without going online, without making some sort of economic interaction um, uh, uh, through digital media. And these tools are broken. And so when our tools are broken, we have to fall back on something. What we fall back on is trust or faith. We have faith in, um, in our dealings with people and organizations and the government and companies and so forth. Now, a lot of these dealings, our faith is reasonably well placed, but some of them, and perhaps an increasing amount of them, our faith is misplaced. And we are finding perhaps that as time goes on and things become more and more opaque, um, the proportion of misplaced faith increases. And unfortunately, the people that we have to trust are often the same people that are the ones that are trying to break our tools in the first place, which leads to a, a vicious circle. Now, I'm also going to put it to you that if this, if civilization as we know it were a person, we would consider this, this behavior, self-harm, right? We would consider it almost feverish. Um, as we, um, as members of society that we place into power, continue to, um, to break society, to break the fabric of society that that very um, 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 placement of power relies upon, which is to say an informed democracy, um, we end up with um, a society and we don't know where it's going. We end up with a broken society full of broken tools and uninformed people. And you only really need to see some of the recent bigger decisions in the world to understand the potential ramifications of this. Um, US leadership and uh, Britain's uh, recent decision to form what certainly a lot of people, although I don't know what the audience here thinks, uh, but certainly a lot of people consider um, self-harm. Now, there's lots of reasons why this happens, and here's a few of them. Um, Ignorance, laziness, greed, incompetence, and pride, right? Lots of reasons why, um, uh, why both those at the top of society and those, those underneath um, allow this to happen or facilitate um, this in happening. But this is nothing new. These are all just very human traits, right? And nothing quite so bad as, uh, as what we are seeing increasingly today has been happening. Um, so what's changing? And I'm going to put it to you, well, the thing that's changing is basically technology is facilitating a greater concentration of power, right? So whereas before, let's say 100 years ago, it was very difficult to do, for one person in the world, to do an awful lot of damage, right? Very difficult. Today, it's actually not so difficult for one person in the world, and we can name a few of those one persons in the world now, to do a lot of damage, yeah? We see sort of doomsday headlines day to day, especially with the increasing tension uh, between the US and North Korea. But we see doomsday headlines increasingly often. And, you know, the banking crisis is one of the sort of more recent cases where um, the doomsday came perhaps a little closer than, uh, than most would have um, appreciated. And not only have we got a uh, concentration of power, but we've also got this problem of, of accountability. The systems, um, the structures of, of, of power that contain the power are relatively difficult to, to see into. And those that are, that are tasked with the job of actually ensuring that those in power act according to the rules that they were placed into power um, uh, with um, are increasingly um, ignorant or find it difficult to, uh, to hold them to account. And if you look at some of the things, some of the... Um, uh, the, the, the sort of reasons and circumstances of the banking crisis, you sort of see that, yeah, actually maybe um, the, the guys who are meant to be watching these guys, maybe they weren't doing their job properly. That was certainly um, one, of the, um, one of the lessons that I came away from that with. In short, the errors of the few, the few who hold the power, become the problems of the many. That's what happens when you concentrate power a little too much, and that leads to structural failure in the system. And there's only one way of, of stabilizing such a system, and that is to dissipate the power from the middle, preferably in a way that isn't so, um, uh, so volatile and disruptive. But ultimately, dilution of power is required. 
So that's, um, in my mind, the, um, the beginnings of, um, of the journey to sort of say, right, well, uh, what, what is Web3 meant to be achieving? So this is, this is meant to be uh, some context, right? It's not necessarily meant to be something that everyone agrees with, but um, it's certainly how I, um, how I look upon the world and what's my motivation for, um, um, for, for bringing this technology um, into the uh, IT sphere. Um, so with the, the second uh, part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about what Web3 really is. Okay, so if we're gonna get a bit complicated, then it's an extensible framework hmm, for creating massively multi-user, economically strong applications. So, um, extensible framework, software framework, framework by which um, software um, can run and interact with other um, pieces of software running, um, allowing users to join in. Massively multi-user, which is to say something equivalent to the web where we're talking about Millions, hundreds of millions, perhaps even a billion or two people actually using software and interacting with each other. Economically strong is one of the key words here, right? Software such as like Facebook or Twitter, not so economically strong. You wouldn't want to send, let's say, transact value or create uh, agreements worth hundreds of millions of dollars over Facebook, right? For that, you would go to a, a standard law firm, perhaps, and, and have them draw up some civil contract that um, referred to some um, uh, jurisdiction that you had actual um, confidence that the law was going to be upheld in. Um, what we're creating, though, is applications that are economically strong, that do give you economically strong guarantees and the ability to make economically strong signals. Um, and that's why I put that um, term in there. So Web3 is really this um, overarching framework that lots of people can use in order to economically interact with each other in ways um, uh, that you would normally have to go to, um, uh, well, let's say financial institutions, banks, governments for. Okay, second point. It's a reliable and robust means of helping your application stay useful in adverse conditions. Now, you can imagine what you, uh, what you want for adverse conditions. Um, adverse conditions could be adverse political conditions, could be adverse technological conditions, adverse environmental conditions. Um, may just be that your internet connection is a bit crappy, right? It, but adverse conditions. And the idea is that it, as, it, as, as those conditions get worse, your application degrades gracefully, which is to say um, it still does something. It might not do as much as it could do when the conditions are better, but it still does something. Um, now, the sorts of thing I'm thinking of here is developed world. You don't always have a connection to the, out, let's say, outside of the village or outside of the town. Sometimes the long distance internet goes down. It would be really good if you don't have to connect to, let's say, the Facebook server in order to communicate with your friend down the road, but rather was able to use something, some local um, uh, mechanisms, some local connectivity in order that the applications still work and you're still able to actually invite your friend for dinner or whatever. This becomes increasingly important than the further, the less developed you get, the further into the jungle that you go. Web3 helps you avoid the responsibility that you don't want. A lot of the time to do business, you need to take on responsibilities. I know this because I've, I've had to take on some of these responsibilities myself. And they are not responsibilities that I want to have. Things that I'm thinking here are data protection laws, right? Not many people want to be subject to data protection laws. It's a pain in the ass. You, it takes a while to sign up. Once you're signed up, you have to be very uh, thoughtful about how you handle data, fulfill all sorts, of, um, all sorts of guarantees. And if you don't, then there's big problems. I don't want that responsibility. I just want to do business. Web3 is a way of ensuring that you don't have to take on that, uh, that responsibility. Now, you don't get the authority that goes with it, of course, but then perhaps that's not your point of business. Perhaps your point of business is something else. Web3 allows you to actually split apart the bits that you actually want to achieve, want to do in your business from the bits that you have to do but you don't want to do and that you would prefer not to do if you had the option. Web3 helps you prove yourself, your identity and your intention. And the last one is very important. When we're interacting with each other, especially when we don't know each other, we're doing, I don't know, some sort of economic interaction across the world. It's very important to be able to prove who you are, 
right? We all know this from uh, very basic centralized versions of this, like the HTTPS and certification service, right? So we go to some root authority that everybody accepts as an authority, and we work our way down the authority tree, each one claiming, each one basically vouching for the next uh, next down until we we trust that the website that our data is coming from is indeed Google or is indeed Facebook Yeah, just normal certificates. But the problem is it's very centralized. We're basically fixed to one authority nobody else really maintains much authorities and It doesn't allow us to prove who we are It only allows it in a one directional in a one directional way very centralized um, the nice thing about Web3, though, is that it doesn't stop in terms of proving that who you are. It allows us to prove what our intention is, which is to say that we can sign up for future um, deals. It allows us to say with, with a strong, economically strong manner, I will be doing this at this point. I will commit to this thing. If you do this, then I will definitely do that in return. And intention is a very important part of dealings. Web3 is open, extensible, and future-proof. I mean, yeah, future-proof. You can call me up on that one if you want. I'm happy to have the, the argument and the discussion. But um, the point of the, the platform is not to be some closed shop that provides everything to everybody. The point of the platform is to be an open group of protocols, each fulfilling their own particular purpose that you can pick and choose from. And it's all, um, each of the protocols have access to both a lower level um, um, a set of tools, or um, um, perhaps, for an example, as an overlay, an overlay network on the internet, a peer network. And they all fit into an umbrella that allows them to access, be accessed by developers, be used by developers, and eventually be, um, be uh, distributed and used by users in much the same way that the Chrome browser allows everybody to go and visit whatever website they want to visit. And finally, Web3 is a new way of architecting web applications. A lot of the time, well, pretty much up until you use anything that's decentralized, up until you think about architecting something on a decentralized platform, you automatically think of things in a very centralized way. We are, by our very nature, centralized beings. Philosophically speaking, we see the world in a very centralized way. We are. We are centric in and of ourselves. If I look at the world, my world has a center, it's in my head, and I see the world through my own eyes. It's very difficult for me to see the world through anyone else's eyes, let alone just take a very general out-of-body view of the world and see all of the world through nobody's eyes. Um, that, that simply doesn't work. And yet, that's exactly how we have to look at these problems when we, att when we attack something in a decentralized way. Web3 is a way of, of doing that. Web3 is a way of, of taking some tools and really attacking a problem in a way um, that gets past this initial centralized means of solving the problem. And actually, finally, it helps us remove the divide between users and service providers. Up until now, pretty much, users and service providers have been different groups of people. Yeah. Now you can take one or two um, um, sort of examples from the peer-to-peer -peer, um, sphere and say, well, actually, they're di they're, you know, um, uh, they were different then. Napster being um, a sort of fairly not notable one, um, BitTorrent, um, and Bitcoin, of course. But by and large, when we use the web, there are service providers and there are users, and the service providers are the ones that make, make the, that make the profit, and the users, by and large, are the ones that pay with the data. Yeah, that's. That's pretty much how the web works. Um, in Web3, that, there's no longer that divide. Users become the service providers, and service providers become the users. The two are the same. Which, of course, leads you to say, well, hold on. If the users are the service providers, how is anyone going to make any profit? Which I'll come on to. Before, I'm just going to quickly go over the stack, the technology stack from... Um, um, a sort of very bird's eye view sort of uh, point of view. So, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a peer to peer internet overlay on the bottom, right? This is what can be accessed by all of the uh, protocols in this notional Web3 stack. I've named three protocols. Um, the first one is the one that, that, that basically is expectation management, it's the one that allows us to state intentions in an economically strong way. Um, which 
most would just think of as blockchain, but I don't want to call it blockchain because I think blockchain is actually just the first step in um, zero trust systems. Um, but I've called them zero or low trust interaction protocols. Second one, static data distribution protocols. Uh, this is basically for when we, we know what data it is that we want, we just don't have it, and we have a way of addressing it. Um, older ones are BitTorrent, a newer one would be IPFS, but there are many others. Final one, a volatile data um, messaging systems, basically publication and subscription, where we, we don't know what data we want, but we know what other people will call that data, and we can ask for it. Um, examples, Whisper, Telehash, many others as well. Above here, a developer API, tool set, languages, all the rest of it, such that people can actually, um, they have an environment to develop applications on. And then finally above that is the, uh, the user software, the, uh, the browser if you like, the harness in which users can actually use these applications. That in a nutshell is Web3 from a, a very um, software architecture point of view. Okay. So, what? Now, in the past, let's say 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, um, physical laws were used as a means of managing, of, 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 of uh, managing the, um, the revenue collection of um, service provision and of um, IP, what we'd, what we'd call today IP. Um, example, um, if I'm a band and I've got like a, a, some music, this is fundamentally, this is IP, right? Copyright. Um, I would put that on a record and the fact that that music could not be sold in any form other than the physical form meant that I could, um, by selling this piece of plastic, this physical piece of plastic, I could reap some profits. I could add a bit of extra, um, 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 I could charge more than the plastic was worth in and of itself, and in doing so I could skim off the profits, which in principle was actually paying me to create that music. The same is true of services, because services typically um, had to be um, performed, at least in part, with a, an, a, a, a physical way. So for example, banking services in the 1950s and 60s, to actually use the banking services, you would walk into a bank. You wouldn't have used internet banking or telephone banking because we didn't have the internet and telephone, well, so much telephones. Um, so you would simply have gone to the bank and actually you know, taken your little book with you and, and they would have stamped it and all the rest of it. This is no longer true. We can circumvent physical limitations now because we can transmit data from point to point in the world by and large without actually having to be there in person, have any sort of physical um, uh, connection. And this obviously uncovered lots and lots of new opportunities for service provision. And as such, value capture is normally uh, now provided by what I think will come to be known as a very archaic practice, which is basically data slavery. We have all your data, and if you want to do anything, you have to come via us. Yeah, Heavily centralized. This is um, um, an obvious way of going about it, of course, um, but I don't think it's the best way. And I mean best, not just in terms of ideology, but also in terms of efficiency. In my mind, in the new model, there will be very clear bidirectional uh, mechanisms for doing both data service provision and service payment, such that we don't make any clear distinction between who has to provide the service and who, must, who wants to actually consume the service the same groups of people will be the ones that provide it as will be the ones that consume it. For example, um, Bitcoin being something that probably most people are familiar with. Um, in Bitcoin, the, uh, the transaction processes, the people that secure the network, at least ideologically and initially, were the very same people um, that used the network to transact value, that sent value across on the network. The protocol made relatively little distinction about who those um, uh, who should be part of those sets. And this was one of the sort of key um, 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 breakthroughs with Bitcoin, was the ability for there not to have to be a, uh, a magic um, set of authorities um, that was very difficult to get into or out of. I think in the future, 
that pattern uh, will be uh, will see in an increasing amount of. Um, and I think one of the uh, uh, particularly interesting ones would be the energy market. So at the moment, energy production is heavily centralized. We have you know, large power stations that provide almost all of the energy for, for, for most societies. Um, this works adequately or has worked adequately, but in the future when energy uh, generation and particularly when um, energy storage is increasingly um, uh, done sort of at home, so to speak, either by people's wall batteries or cars, um, solar panels or wind turbines in their garden, uh, whatever it will be, um, we will increasingly need an efficient way of getting energy onto the grid and off the grid in a way that kind of blurs the lines between who exactly is a consumer and who exactly is a producer. Now at the moment, we don't really have the, we have a very sort of black and white system whereby there are producers, there are consumers, and then we have a feed-in tariff for the consumers that happen to produce a little bit, but we don't really care about that. Um, in the future, there will be less of a distinction between real producers and real consumers. There will simply be nodes on an energy network that will both push in and pull out energy when it suits them according to the market. And this, the reason that we'll have this is simply because it's that much more efficient. Okay, so um, finishing up, um, I just want to do a very quick sort of, um, you know, where, where is this heading? Um, Web3 is an idea more than anything else. Um, it's certainly no um, single person or company or piece of software. Um, it's, if anything, just a way of sort of seeing how software, how the systems, how the, how the internet, how the web itself might evolve in the future. There are lots of potential bits of software that could be a part of it. Um, there are some of them. Um, but we don't know how it's going to end up. Um, some of these may end up being not very, um, not significant part of it. Others may end up being a very significant part of it. We don't know at this point, but we do know the sorts of properties that these bits of software, that these protocols will have. Um, they will have open, um, some sort of open governance structure. Um, they will be extensible. They will fit within a framework so that they can be used with other bits of, um, of software. Now, there is a, uh, a foundation um, that I set up not that long ago here in Zug, the lovely place of Zug. Um, and this will um, advocate and support um, this um, movement, let's say, this general um, uh, change in how um, uh, software is architected and, um, and, and utilized uh, on the internet. And uh, yeah, as much as possible, encourage a positive outcome. Um, I created a, uh, a lovely motto. There you go. I thought it was good. <laughs> um, less trust, more truth, Web3. Uh, yeah, are there any questions? You can ask anything you want. Preferably about Web3, but... <laughs> Um, it didn't seem an obvious uh, um, uh, thing that might, uh, eventuality, um, in that the systems that the government has at the moment are apparently more or less 100% centralized um, and 100% opaque. And so it was very difficult to see how um, something that is kind of fundamentally transparent and, you know, at least, um, uh, at least a little bit decentralized um, could make it worse. But I'm happy to um, uh, to hear how you how you think it may have been. Worse. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I mean, you never know. Um, there are always unknown unknowns. But as much as I can uh, I can tell, um, the current um, the current situation is that. Um, things are very heavily centralized and not very transparent. And so, on balance, 
I think it's relatively, I think there are, there are many other things that could go wrong than um, blockchain turning out to actually be a huge centralization factor. Yeah, sure. Um, so at the top level, um, the governance is um, uh, me and four other guys. Um, so uh, Rito, um, Matthias, Matthias here? No, okay. In the other room, maybe? Okay. Um, a guy called Aaron Buchanan um, and a guy called um, uh, Peter uh, Sharpen. Um, the, uh, that's that's at the council level. Underneath the council level is a bunch of um, technical governance um, and um, advisory, advisory sort of stuff. Um, the advisory board is yet to be finalized, but that'll be sort of finalized soon and, and, and published. Um, and the technical, um, sort of technical governance, which is the ones that probably have the most sway in terms of how, uh, what the Web3 Foundation does in terms of standards, in terms of pushing software. Um, uh, I'm not allowed to mention who's on it yet because they, while well, they don't want any um, uh, any of the limelight, while there is a, a sort of crowdfunding thing going on, but um, in the not too distant future, probably about a week and a half, two weeks, then that will be um, that will be published. But you know, there's people that are recognisable faces in the world of decentralised technology that will be um, that will be joining. Web, that rough sketch of Web3 stack that you described, mm -hmm. where do you think that databases would fit in? So, I mean, dynamic data that needs to be constantly changed. Um, I mean, I look at databases as sort of a tool that, that, that stick around on the client side. Um, so, um, there would be um, s sort of what we think of databases will probably be part of all of the protocols in there because the clients themselves would have state. Right, so they're not, they're not stateless things in much the same way that um, they would be potentially stateless. Certainly, traditional architectures would have the client be stateless and the server be uh, fairly heavily state stateful. In the case of Web3, all of the clients would be fairly heavily stateful. So, um, for example, the blockchain would have a database backing it, which actually stores the blocks or a subset of the blocks if it's, a relative, if it's sort of a lighter um, version of a blockchain. Um, the messaging protocol would have a database that stores um, uh, messages, tr probably transiently, as they're passing through, um, particularly capturing onto the ones that the, the local client node would find interesting or has stated this, that the software running on the client node has stated that it would find interesting. And the, um, the publication service, the sort of IPFS or BitTorrent, would probably have a database that held onto all of the various blobs of data um, for which, again, um, the, uh, the software decided that it, it felt was, um, uh, was better to, to have stick around. Um, it, it's th these would probably, um, by and large, account for all of the state that would normally be stored in a database. So the stuff that's 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 very important would be stored on the blockchain, like kind of um, how many likes does something have? <laughs> very important, right? Um, uh, the stuff that's sort of um, um, important but transient. Um, um, rather than permanent, will be stored within the messaging system. And the stuff that's, um, that basically never changes, but isn't that kind of, is, is let's say larger clumps of data where we just need to ensure that it sticks around for a long time. Example here would be um, historical blocks or historical transactions or historical chat history, as opposed to the present chat history, uh, would be, um, that kind of makes sense, uh, would be stored um, uh, on the, um, within this, um, um, this middle component, the sort of um, IPFS um, or, or whatever. Um, I kind of want to give a seminar on how to think in a decentralized fashion, like re, uh, reimagine architect, like software architecture. If you can't have that central server component, the bit that you guarantee is an authority and stores all of the world in its in its in its database, because it is difficult to like to think in that way. But um, this talk probably isn't the right place. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Sorry. So, uh, what's the stated purpose of the foundation, and what role do you imagine it playing in the in the mix? Um, I. It's really an enabler. Um, so, I, I, you know, so up front, 
the, the, um, the point of the foundation is to nurture, um, to steward where necessary, to support and to advocate for these, these technologies. Um, it doesn't, uh, for some of the technologies, it's going to have a greater uh, sort of um, 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 uh, role than for others. Um, some, some technologies that are rightly sort of a part of this new decentralized web um, that are, have their own sort of, um, um, sort of uh, fiber in the tapestry will be, uh, have their own um, organization behind them. There's no need for them to be sort of stewarded by, by uh, the foundation. Um, others, there's a greater need. Um, really, it comes down to putting, uh, putting forward a vision, advocating it, and coordinating efforts. Um, and to that end, the sorts of things I see it doing are um, kind of helping meetups, sponsoring meetups, sponsoring presentations, sponsoring conferences, um, getting developers together, um, ensuring that the right people are talking to the right other people, um, and funding projects where it's very difficult for those projects to raise funds for whatever reason. Yes. Uh, what do you think of all current blockchain 3.0 initiatives with a ton of money going on? <laughs> and how they compare to uh, Web3? Um, I, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of initiatives, it's true. Um, certainly more than there were when Ethereum was, was a baby. Um, I think that they... I think, firstly, it's probably a bit too early to, to call... Um, call out sort of winners at this point. Um, many of them have uh, raised important um, points over, um, over how the technology should evolve, um, what features are important, what steps are important. Um, my, main, uh, my main hope is that the, the, there, there can be cross-pollination, so that discoveries um, in, let's say, um, smart contract languages or form proving systems can make their way over to um, um, to other blockchains that are maybe concentrating on consensus mechanisms. Um, I, I really hope that um, in terms of communication, the, um, the hype dies down a little and the, um, the underlying sort of uh, how uh, the technological contributions um, uh, become better understood. I feel that in some cases there is probably a little too much hype. Um, but you know, we'll um, uh, we'll see. I guess probably over the next year or two, we'll um, we'll get a much better understanding about which ones were the ones to uh, where, where there was you know serious um, research and development efforts, and uh, which ones were perhaps um, a little more um, all mouth and no trousers. Uh, healthcare is uh, highly regulated uh, by uh, organizations such as FDA and uh, highly monopolized by big pharma companies. Uh, but yes, and it looks like an obvious thing that we could uh, use a blockchain to de decentralize this monopoly and this uh, re regulatory, regulatory functions. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, in the healthcare, we are talking about people lives, right? So. Uh, we should rely on uh, somebody's authority, still should rely on somebody's authority. So how could we use uh, the blockchain uh, to decentralize this uh, monopoly at, at the same time have uh, the, the uh, authorities of researchers, of scientists and of doctors mm. to be uh, transparent for the end patients? Thank um, you. Cool, uh, good question. So the... Um the thing about blockchain is it's no silver bullet, right? It's there in order to provide a means of having rules without rulers. In that sense, it's sort of the, the greatest toolkit the anarchist um, would, uh, would hope for. Um, but a critical thing is that for any given application, you have to be clear about what you want the rules to be, right? It, it can't just create the rules for you and make the situation just work. So. Um, if you can state what you want the rules to be, then probably there's a way to implement it using a blockchain. Um, now, you may need some other crypto stuff, like a decentralized secret store or whatever, and that would certainly uh, uh, be, be uh, 
one of my thoughts for, for healthcare. Um, but basically, we can, we can architect whatever system needs to be architected if the rules that the system should operate under and should uphold are themselves well defined. Um, now, in the case of uh, healthcare, I think there's, there's a pretty good um, opportunity. Um, blockchain would only be half of the puzzle. So, blockchain can guarantee that um, there is. Um, uh, uh, some degree of accountability so that we can uh, ensure that whoever has issued instructions was um, uh, was uh, irrevocably recorded um, and we can uh, we can use the crypto in order to ensure that we actually know the identities of all of the uh, participants at play um, the other half of the puzzle would be provided by a decentralized secret store which is basically a way of allowing um, a set of validators authorities or or whatever a set of partially trusted um, um, nodes or participants in order to have um, some administrative control over uh, the data flow without actually ever um, um, uh, having the data be accessible to themselves. They're able to pass encrypted data on to um, whoever it is that they can all, as a group, agree should actually have the data. So then it becomes a case of, right, well, all we need now are the rules to determine who should have the data and in what situation um, they should have it. Now, those that, that you know, determining what situation um, someone should be able to have someone else's health information is a perhaps difficult thing, but I'm sure that, uh, you know, people familiar with the domain uh, would be able to, um, to architect that rule set off the top of my head. Um, every registered paramedic um, could perhaps um, uh, state this is an emergency. Every registered doctor um, could state I am here. The paramedic could therefore um, uh, facilitate the doctor, so that sort of those two of them, different um, uh, different uh, sort of classes of entity, could collaborate together in order to unlock any given person's uh, healthcare records, which would be stored um, in a decentralized secret store um, online. That's roughly speaking how I would start. Um, there are all sorts of sort of you know additional uh, subtleties, but um, uh, in and of itself, I think the blockchain could be useful. Uh, yeah. From a systems architecture analysis perspective, if you had a descriptive scale from zero to ten, whereby ten uh, zero equals closed, static, and self-referential, and ten equals open, adaptive, and anonymous, uh, autonomous. Sorry, not anonymous, autonomous. Where would Web three be on that scale? Okay, uh, so zero was closed, static, and self-referential. Can I ask why self-referential? Like closed and static seems seems quite reasonable. Self-referential is it only knows about itself and it only cares about itself. Okay, would you call a government oh. self-referential? Like a, a, a you know absolutely. <laughs> Okay. I mean, because I would say a government can kind of, you know, knows about the voters, right? It knows about this, it has an idea that there are people outside of itself um, that, uh, you know, for which are a resource, um, uh, both a resource drain um, and, a, and a resource income, um, and ultimately, at least in principle, uh, the ones that can, um, can, can facilitate a change um, in the government. So, is it, is it, I can see a government knows about itself, so it's self-referential in that way, but it, it surely knows m more than just itself. Maybe its motivations. Hmm. Okay, um, where would three be? Um, example or, or abstract description? Switzerland? Switzerland? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I would say of uh, if if we're talking example countries, I would say probably in reality Switzerland does actually score quite well on the um, um, sort of uh, 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 decentralized. Um, um, maybe I don't. I'm self-referential. Not so sure, but open and and, and <coughs> changeable. Um, at least in potency, if not in, in reality. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a country, so it's still 
um, uh, it's still got a government, it's still relatively um, opaque. Um, so below five? I don't know. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two more questions. Okay. I have a kind of a cynical question, right? Uh, so with each technological revolution, uh, people actually had a very good intention. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to enslave someone. That was not how you created a new technology, right? For example, data slavery uh, was not the intention of the internet. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen with Web3 that is not intended? Uh, we are already seeing oligarchs, uh, first movers having a great advantage. So how do you look at it? Um, I mean, this is a little similar to the um, uh, to the earlier question, and it, it's. I guess the only real way of looking up on this is um, throughout history. If you look at any sort of endeavor, any field of, of technology. Um, things have always moved from um, basically um, non-existent to centralized to decentralized. So I'll give you a few examples. Software development. It started with, um, well, it, it, it started before it was really existent. Basically, it was there was nothing. There was a few random sort of hackers, but they didn't really interact. There was, there was no real interaction. And then there became companies like IBM who were the cathedrals of software development, right? Strict hierarchies, um, jobs split up into smaller and smaller pieces until eventually it was um, someone writing a subroutine at the bottom. All put back together until the top of the hierarchy and you had your program. Um, then we got systems like uh, GNU, Linux, um, um, open source software. Um, and what this did, it, it sort of um, stripped back all of that structure and it created a new way of allowing many different people to collaborate and create software. Um, now, there was a reason why it happened in that order. And the reason was it needed other technology, other discoveries to come about before um, you could decentralize the creation of software. Specifically, it needed the internet, it needed email, it needed use groups, it needed the web. Yeah? There was no way of, of doing that kind of decentralized development until it got to the point um, of having the internet and the associated tools. Up until that point, you needed a centralized, uh, high, rigid hierarchy. Now, of course, we've gone a step further and we have this kind of Git-style uh, peer development that's even more decentralized. It used to be the case that you had basically a project lead and if the project forked at all, it was considered a disaster because now you would have two different um, leaders of the same project. And they'd go off in different directions, they'd bump heads and there'd be lots of arguments and it would be very problematic. And now we have the situation where software um, can be developed, often is developed, with multiple different leads and there's lots of cross-pollination because we have such good support for things like um, pull requests and, and merges. Yeah? That again required new technologies. It required, well, Git, GitHub, and various other sort of um, uh, decentralized version control systems. We see this repeated in many different, um, in many different areas, right? And so um, I look upon this as not so much, you know, a new technology for which we have the option of inf introducing, but rather just a natural progression of, of things. Um, the web started basically non-existent. It then became centralized as it grew because centralization is just the most obvious way of implementing something. It's how we're all taught at university when we study computer science. It's how we come into the world thinking. We come into a very centralized world. I see the world through my eyes, not anyone else's. And so um, it takes time and it takes other technologies before we can understand how to take um, our, what we wanted to do originally, our original product, and do so in a decentralized way. 
and we are slowly understanding that. That was sort of the, the birth of peer-to-peer, -peer, birth of, of you know, Napster and BitTorrent and Bitcoin, it's all sort of um, uh, important um, technological advancements that allow us to recreate the products that we've already done, but do so in a way that is that much more robust and reliable. Um, so I, I just see it as, as, uh, as a, a natural progression more than um, anything, let's say, um, revolutionary, such as the, the Industrial Revolution, which really did sort of alter um, 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 and create um, a lot of uh, changes in that round. We're going to have to stop there. Okay. But please, very, very warm um, round of applause for Gavin. I'm sure he's around in the coffee break if you want to take any more questions. And when we come back, last segment of the day, we're going to hear from Reto Trinkler, uh, Trinkler on uh, vision and outlook. And then we're going to uh, finish with uh, Amir Taki, who's going to give us some closing comments and thoughts from the conference. Very much looking forward to it. And we're back here in 15 minutes, I think. 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>